You know, something about resurrecting the dead, that's what I call it. When you've got something that's a dead horse that's been sitting in a barn or a garage for 20, 30 years and somebody finds it and says, hey, let's freshen that up. Let's put some late model horsepower in it. Let's make it new again, you know. That's the joy in all this for me. Anyway. Paint. There are so many ways to build it. It is the most important thing, I think. It, it's what draws people to the car. In school, I would look at the car magazines, you know, the, they were small then. Carcraft was a small little magazine. You could put it inside your school book. That's what got me started, you know. I started painting motorcycles because they were small and I, I consider them today to be difficult items to paint. Because when you're painting a small item with a large gun, you know, you have to know how to set the gun up to do it right. You know, this is a great way to learn how to paint. And so that's what I started with. I went to a Honda dealer one day and they just started bringing them over, the CL-72s and 77s. And I said, when you get one of these in out of the crate, why don't you pull the sheet metal off one time and let me bring some parts down to the shop. And I did a candy apple red on this bike and brought the parts back. And he put the bike together and he pushed it out on the show floor and put the kickstand down and 20 minutes later it was sold. I met uh, Frank Nicholas, uh, who was a partner of mine for a year. And he had a friend that owned a body shop, Tom's Auto Body. So his deal with me was, if you want to help pay the rent on the shop for painting your motorcycle stuff, you got to paint a car for me once in a while. I, oh yeah, are you kidding me? I wound up buying Tom out. Back then I was making my own candies using the old nitro toners. I bought some stuff from out of California that some guy claimed to have the best custom paint. And I got it back here and I had 10 coats on and I could still I didn't have the color that I wanted. And I, that, that was the send off right there. I was mad, I was angry. And I thought, you know, I need to find out what goes into this and why are these guys cheating me on the colorant that needs to be in this product? They wanna sell more paint? Is that how they're gonna do it? Well, the hell with it. I'm gonna find out what makes paint. So I went to the library, started reading about paint manufacturing and books. And I think the pivotal thing was my wife. Uh, took a night course on oil painting. The guy next to her was a doctor of polymer chemistry working for a resin company that makes uh, paints for automobiles. With that start and using his name, I was able to get into some big companies that normally would never talk to some little guy, you know? And so uh, I found out which resin was the best one for what I was trying to do. And I started buying drums of resin and making my own stuff, never intending to sell 10 cents of it to anybody. I was doing it for me. I just wanted to have control over what I was doing. And one day with my lawyer here, he was standing up front. I had mixed a gallon of candy color for somebody and I was pushing the gallon across the counter. And he said, what's that? I said, well, I just sold him a gallon of my candy paint that I make. And he said, where's the label? What, you don't have a label? No, you have to have the warnings on here and stuff. He said, if you're gonna manufacture, and I like the sound of that, if you're gonna be a manufacturer, never entered my mind. I thought, you know, I am doing something unique here. And so we developed the first label. So that was when I started thinking about really getting serious about this. You know, there's, there's some arguments of how that all started. I said, well, we got a lot of paint on the shelves. It's like our little place is nothing but color, so it's a house of color. And then I changed it to K on the color just because of my last name, Kosmoski. And I got permission to do that from uh, George Barris. He invited me in the shop and just said, I mean, I'm just a kid, you know, he was really friendly. He said, just walk around, help yourself, you know. They caught me in the paint room and told me to get out of there. They didn't want me in the paint room. I started going to the car shows with the stuff that I had painted 
and I started winning all these best paint awards. I mean, I was taking them from everybody because of the quality of the color. Walk into a show at one point in time, and you could point at the cars that had House of Color on them because they stood out that much. I think it was 1980 when I closed the body shop and realized that the tail had started to wag the dog. You know, we always thought that the tail was the paint business. We're just never going to get that big with it. Uh, it turned out to dominate. It was hard to pay the bills. We had to get a line of credit. I remember sitting in there counting the receipts and looking at the bills. The bills outweighed the receipts. And so that's when the hours grew. I started putting in my 12, 14 hour days. Um, I did that for 14 years. I, I told Patty I'll be home on Saturday at 5 o'clock to have dinner with the family. And I'm coming in in the morning on Sunday. I'll be home at noon uh, to spend the rest of the day with the family, whatever we want to do. It was seven days a week, you know, for a lot of years to build up, just to stay alive, to stay here and make it happen. You know, we started out with 50 gallon batches and then grew to 150 gallon batches. That was right at the time that I started doing the urethane coatings. I had the first wet-on-wet -wet European technology. It's heavy UV to protect the finishes, the crack-resistant coatings, using pure 100% organic pigments, the candy base coats, the encapsulated bases, the super transparent candies. Yeah, they all came from me. That was an exciting time because this company grew so fast we couldn't keep up. I was starting to get distribution in the warehouses in California, and it started selling off the shelf. And we were really doing well. I mean, things were really starting to jump. We'd be sitting there taking orders all day long. And then he'd come back and he'd go, wow, <laughs> you know. I didn't know how to say it then, that this is the best. You're not buying anything else like this anywhere else. I think the Egyptians were the first civilization to spend a lot of time on art. And so they always interested me, the Egyptians. And so I would buy manuals and read stuff about the findings at King Tut's tomb and all that. And when they unwrapped him, the closest thing to his chest was a scarab beetle. And I thought, why, why was that so important uh, to him that it was the closest thing to his body before they wrapped him? They would watch the beetle scurry along the sand with food and dig a hole and go down in the ground and the next day at noon, they'd be in the same place and they'd see the beetle come back up out of the sand and live another full lifetime. So it was considered the sign of everlasting life. I thought, this is the perfect logo for my company. One that has everlasting life, and who better to show it off than Ra the Sun God? The city of Minneapolis, they were gonna start fining me $10,000 a month because I was over the city's VOC limits. I bought a building down here and that was gonna be the new house of color. I mean, we were set up to expand and then the city said, we do not want you there. I don't care that you've bought the building. We want the building to have a Walgreens store on it. I said, my business grew. Uh, when was I supposed to come to you and tell you I, I was over 500 gallons? Nobody ever told me that. That's what happened. There's a Walgreens down there now on 46th and Hiawatha. Valspar had come to me and asked me if I could help them with their clear. They were having trouble with their automotive clear. I'm developing new colors, which is the exciting part for me. And it's good to be back in the trenches. to promote going to all the shows, going to the little car shows and picking out our customers one at a time and working with them, you know, spending time with the customer. That's the key thing, you know. Large companies are trying to figure out what does it take to keep your customer. Well, you have to treat them with respect and be there to help them to make sure the job turns out well and obviously give them the best products that you can make. That's what we've always done. I look at it like it's all common sense but common sense is so rare it should be called uncommon sense. I'm a perfectionist to an extent, but, but I know it doesn't exist, but you can get very, very close. I look at things like how I can change them, how I can make them better, and a bit of a futurist.
always working on new stuff. You kind of have to funnel in on the colors you're working on. I haven't met anybody that's got it all figured out, but I've probably made more mistakes than most people you know because I've been out there breaking ground. I just don't think the paint industry would be where it is if it weren't for him. Mainly as an innovator, I mean, that truly is what he is. He's the color guy.